Live from the 607, it is the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking sports locally and nationally. Why don't you join in the conversation with the hashtag ODPH. Here we go. Welcome to another edition of the ODPH. I'm your host, Ken M. Sitting across from me this week is the one, the only, Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to discuss. Let's waste no more time. Hashtag it with us, ODPH. We want to hear from you. So let's break down our locks and leaps, shall we? Mm-hmm. Pad, you want to kick us off? Well, it's you know, it's funny. The last two weeks, I went like 4-0 in locks and leaps, and my fantasy team went 0-4. and mm-hmm. This week, I went 0-2 in locks and leaps, and I went... 2-0 and in fantasy. Weird how that works. What am I going to do? Uh, for my lock, I took the San Diego Chargers over the Denver Broncos at home. However, it was spoiled by, if I'm not mistaken, a late last-minute field goal by the Denver Broncos to seal a win 23-22 over the Los Angeles Chargers. I love it that you introduced them as the San Diego Chargers because I still do eh. the same thing too. They eh. are San Diego in my heart, and they will always forever be. But I got to agree with you, too. This was an upset. I had this as my lock as well. Mm -hmm. And the Chargers have been playing lights out, no pun intended, for a while now. They were on a heck of a win streak. They were creeping back into, I mean, obviously they're facing the Chiefs, so they're kind of, you know, want to maintain a playoff position. Right. But this was a game, and for Denver, it's a rivalry game, and you knew it was going to be a tough one. Right, and, and you look at the Denver Broncos schedule as it stands. I mean, they're 4-6, and six, they, you know, they're, so you're looking at it on paper. Go, so there were 3-6 and six going into the game. You're looking at it on paper going, okay, yeah, the Chargers are firing on all cylinders. The Broncos, yeah, it's hit or miss. They've got some bright spots, but nothing really flashing out at you. And, and just, you know what, it's like you say, Divisional game, they're going to step up. Yeah, it's just one of those things that no matter how bad a team is, and let's face it, Denver is not a good team. Great defense, offensive struggles, though, without mm-hmm. question. Yeah. They don't have a true quarterback at the position, and this is coming back to haunt them in many games this season. Right, I mean, Case Keenum had a, had a good game. I mean, 19 for 32, 205 yards, no touchdowns. It's, it's, it's okay. But then you look at Phillip Rivers, who was throwing the ball all over the damn yard. Yeah, 401 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions, though. Right, yeah. But you knew you were facing Denver's defense. You were probably going to have an yeah. interception. Yeah. Two, kind of pushing it. But either way, it was going to go down. But for how they came out of the gate, though, I mean, obviously, first quarter was a little rough. They were just kicking field goals, but you knew Denver had a good defense, mm-hmm. and they were kind of holding them back a little bit. But once the game started progressing further, I mean, halftime, it was 13-7 Chargers. And then as we get into the fourth qu- or third and fourth quarters, that's where Denver was slowly creeping back in. Uh-huh. And this is where they finally got their run game going a little bit. Phil Lindsay had two touchdowns Yep. You know, for the, for the day. And obviously, when it comes down to a late minute field goal, uh huh. And Brandon McManus is no joke on kicking field goals. Nope. So obviously, you know, when you put him in the position to win, he's going to be one of those guys that's going to nail that shot. Uh huh. And for the Chargers, is it a bad loss? I don't know. Yeah. And this is why I say this: every loss. I mean, obviously, when you lose, is bad. But they're on such a win streak that is it going to hurt them this? time in the season i don't think so no i think it was if it was early in the year and it was you know a couple of losses in a row that would be like okay yeah this isn't good it's one loss you know it's their first loss since they played the rams or like week three of the season mm-hmm. they'd rattle off one two three four five six in a row before this loss not a, it's not a, obviously it's a loss it's never good like you said but it's not the worst thing in the world. No, it's something they can definitely bounce back from because next week I believe they have Arizona, Uh huh. if I'm not mistaken. And at not, home. And, yeah, at the at L.A. Stadium. So, obviously, this is something the Chargers are going to learn from because yeah. this is a game they, they should have won on paper. Oh, yeah. Without question. Oh, yeah. They should have won. By seven, eh, debatable. But they should have won. But, I don't, like I said, long term, I don't think it's going to hurt them no. in any chance because of how the AFC is stacked right now. And for Denver, I mean, it's a good win. I mean, obviously, when you can take down a division foe, yeah, it's always a good one. I mean, their season, yeah, obviously, they're kind of thinking maybe more towards next season. It's a little bit to be desired. Yeah, obviously it is. But when you don't come out the gate you know, strong, it's always tough mm-hmm. to sneak in those playoffs and them being, what, four and six. Probably not making the playoffs, but no. you never know. I mean, crazier stuff has happened. I would say if, if if the Chargers get anything out of this, it's that game where, you know, they they don't necessarily sleep on a team, but, like, 
they, they kind of catch him by surprise and it kind of wakes him up to the, okay, we can't take anybody lightly no matter who they are, no matter what their record is. Yeah, and that's something that they got to learn going forward because now as we're getting into the month of December, this is where the crunch time happens and this is where the teams need to win games that they should win to get those playoff spots. Mm-hmm. Pat, what you got for your leap? Well, for my leap, I was drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit. I took the Tennessee Titans to beat the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, I was wrong on a lot of fronts. But I do want to point out one thing. What's that? One thing I saw online today. So the last four teams to beat the New England Patriots uh, and their record since beating New England, that would be the uh, Philadelphia Eagles, Mm -hmm. the Jacksonville Jaguars, Mm -hmm. Detroit Lions, Mm -hmm. and the Tennessee Titans. Uh, Their record since beating that team, Eagles 4-6, Jaguars 1-7, Lions 3-4, Titans 0-1. And that is a crazy stat to come up with. Uh huh. Well played, sir. Well Thank played. You. And Patriots are done. Stop. Yeah, no, who was nobody's writing the Patriots off after last week. I mean, obviously it was an upset win. Oh yeah. But in the East, they're going to win the East. But look, at, at worst case scenario, yeah. they win the East. Oh yeah. But like I said, this game, I was drinking the Kool Aid. I was kind of you know believing in, in in Tennessee a little bit. You know, given how well they played against the Patriots, Indy. Yeah, I don't really know what you're going to get. Uh, Andrew Luck proved me wrong with 297 yards for on 23 of 29 uh, passing for three touchdowns. Holy cow. And I think I saw a thing, and I could be wrong on this, so apologies if I'm wrong. He didn't get sacked once this entire game for, like, the third straight game or something like that. He's on, a sta- like, a sackless streak. Yeah, it's it, like three games in a row he hasn't been sacked. I want to say it's, like, five. Oh, wow. It's, some, it's a crazy stat. We're going to try tracking that down. But either way, if you keep luck upright and they finally got that offense clicking, yeah, it's been a while. But T.Y. Hilton, nine receptions, 155 yards, and two touchdowns. That's what they need. They got 61 yards and a touchdown out of Mac. So when they get the ball rolling, they definitely did their thing. And for the defense, they held the Titans in check. I mean, obviously, oh, yeah. Mariota, I believe, left the game. Gabbert. Uh, came in for him for 118 and one touchdown, but one interception either way. The defense stepped up for the Colts, and they did what they needed to mm-hmm. do. And obviously, like I said, there was a shift in the quarterback role, so obviously it wasn't Mariota. But either way, when the Colts got clicking, yeah, they really took that game over. I'll say they finished the first quarter was seven nothing, and then they rattled off 17 points in the second quarter. Yeah, and that's just crazy because. Indy has not been putting up a lot of offensive numbers, per se. No. Like, they're putting up you know, about 20, 24 a game. Yeah. But for 38, I mean, that's a huge win for them. And that's nothing but confidence because, as we were seeing with the AFC South, everybody, after the start of the season, was penciling in Jacksonville. Oh, we yeah. run away oh, with yeah. that. Oh, Houston yeah. was dead to rights. And now Indy is creeping back in this race. Yep. And this is now going to be one to watch that's a little flying under the radar. But either way, this is something that for Indy, you got to be excited about. You have to be. Because if you can get the ball rolling late, they're still in a playoff spot that they could sneak in. Yeah. If they just, you know, they got to have a lot of luck, no pun intended. But they need to just play solid football. And if they can get that offense clicking, the defense can bend but not break. They got a chance to sneak into a wild card position. I really feel that. Oh, yeah. Because their division, to me, is still wide open. Houston is my overall prediction at this point to win that division because I think they got the most talent. Right. But I'm not sleeping on Indy. Oh, yeah. As the playoff uh, conference standings sit, it looks like uh, ten, uh, Excuse me, uh, Indy is sitting at a nine seed, but there's also like a two or three team tie with the same record. So yeah, they're so, right there. Yeah, so they're right in there on paper. I mean, they haven't been eliminated yet, and, and I don't think too many teams have. No, no. But for this is a good win for them, and I mean, especially against a division foe, because now this is where those divisional wins are just factoring in so much. Mm-hmm. Because if it comes down to a couple teams that are right there in it. I mean, we talk about the NFC East a lot. Yeah. The AFC South is just in the same predicament. Oh, yeah. That it's almost fair game for any team in there to sneak in there and win. And it's almost a guarantee that you get to the end of the year and it's like the last week or two of the season. And, you know, you start watching NFL Network, Fox, ESPN, whoever, and they start talking playoff scenarios. And then it's like, okay, they need X to happen, Y to happen, and Z to happen. And this is because they lost in week whatever against the divisional foe. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And this is what comes back to haunt. I mean, this is why every game matters so much in the NFL, but it also depends on where you are in your schedule at that time that you have a win or you have a loss. Right. If you come out the gate slow, it comes back to haunt you. If you're doing well early and you kind of fade a little bit midseason, but you can rally it to, at the end, that doesn't hurt you that much. For Indy, this is a good win. This is a very good win. Yeah. And for Tennessee, like I said, Mariota was out. Gabbert came in. It's something that, depending on what they're going to do moving forward, Tennessee, you just don't know what you're going to get each week. No. You really don't. I mean, some games they really look – they they play solid. I mean, they, oh, they yeah. don't really get blown yeah. – I wouldn't say they get blown out. But they play solid enough, but you just don't know what you're going to get on that offense. Let's say it's one of those things that's like, okay, which Marcus Mariota is going to show up? Is it going to be the one who plays really well and manages the game really well? Or is it going to be the one that kind of looks like a deer in the headlights? Yeah, I mean, that's something that they got to answer moving forward. But – I think if they can somehow get the offense clicking, they'll contend. I don't think they make the playoffs this year. I, just, no. I, tr- I truly don't like my gut instinct. I'm just saying no. But we'll have to see what happens. Now, as, as we previously said, my lock was the Chargers. We don't need to rehash that up again. That, that hurt me a lot on fantasy football too, by the way. So we're just, we're going to just lay off that topic right now. Fair enough. But we'll go to the leap. And my leap was Washington mm-hmm. against Houston. Yep. And this one, ah, I, I – uh, take the score away from the game. Yeah. The worst thing that happened this day was what happened to Alex Smith. And the weird stuff coming out about it and the circumstances surrounding it. Because the more you see stuff, the weirder it gets. This Alex Smith, in case anybody does not know, suffered a gruesome uh-huh. leg injury. I, I don't normally recommend people to not see the video. Like I normally ask, see if you want, see if you don't. Uh, in this case, I would recommend you if you, you don't look at the video. No, this one is very tough to watch. Now, me, I have a very strong stomach. Oh, so do I, but even I was like, ah. I, yeah, I could, not, I could not handle this one. No. This one was just a horrific leg injury. You, and the crazy stuff I mentioned before, uh, it, it, the injury is drawing comparisons to when uh, Joe Theismann was injured years ago. And the weird circumstances with that was it was uh, November 18th, so 33 years to the day. Mm. Uh, it was also in a game in Washington, and the final score of both games was 23-21. Yeah, it's a weird like, yeah. comparison. And one like I, I really don't even like talking about because no. I, I we don't wish injury on anybody. No, no. And especially that one, which... I, I am hoping, and I think I speak for the rest of the panel, the speediest and healthiest of recoveries. Yes. And I'm hoping he's going to be able to play next year. I'm hoping he gets to play, period. Because yeah. obviously the differences between when Joe Theismann played and when Alex Smith played is the advances the medical field has made. And I know immediately when he got injured and they were like, all right, no, we need to get this you know, wrapped up. They put it in one of the I, – I don't know what they're called, but they're like the airtight – you know, casts. Yeah, the air, the air, like body casts is almost. Like. Yeah, yeah. So they put it in that. So hopefully that helped, and hopefully he, everything goes well for him, and he can make a speedy recovery and, and come back next year. Yeah, because I, like I said, if you do see that injury, uh, it, it is painful to sit through and, and watch. And it, and like I said, I, I, if you haven't seen it, just take our word for it. Yeah, honestly. But getting back to the rest of the game, I mean, Houston. Talk about teams getting hot at the right time. Uh-huh. They extend their win streak to seven games. Which is insane because I know a lot of people were kind of doubting them and going semi-writing them off after their three-game losing streak. Mm-hmm. And that's just the thing about the NFL. is just it, For some teams, it takes a while to get going. Obviously, yeah. Houston had some injuries beginning of the season, and especially with Deshaun Watson coming back off to his injury last year. Yeah. It takes a little while to kind of get, yeah. the, dare I say, the ring rust off, yeah, if, I mean, if we can use an MMA term. Yeah, and you hear about it in baseball, too, where you know you got a pitcher coming back from Tommy John. Okay, he's out for a year, but realistically, it's like a year and a half before he's back to what he was before, if he ever is again. Mm-hmm. And it's just something that going into the game, I mean, Watson, did, he did struggle. He didn't have the greatest stat line no. ever. It was 208 for one touchdown and two interceptions. But Houston hung in there. I mean, they had a 101-yard interception touchdown return by Justin Reed. That was insane. Yeah, that helped huge Yeah, to bail them out because if that didn't happen, Washington wins that game. So that was a definite spark for Houston. Yeah, and that's what they need because if they can get that defense going, everybody knows about their offense and yeah. their passing game. Yeah. Because now, I mean. Well, it's because they got Bill O'Brien, and Bill O'Brien's an offensive guy. Yeah, but that's what they but they need that defense to be that lights-out defense. Yes, yes. That it, I mean, it hasn't been in a while. 
I mean, and, and, then, it, and it doesn't even need to be lights out. It just needs to be like, all right, we can get a few stops here. We don't need to shut them down 100%, but we can make some stops. No, but they need to make stops, especially if Watson is struggling. Yes. they got to have that balance. Yes. And and that's the thing with him. It's It all rides on Watson's shoulders. If he's struggling, that defense needs to step up. Because Watson, as it stands in 2018, as we're recording, Watson is not the type of player that – you know, you as a head coach or an offensive coordinator, you can go, okay, we're taking some lumps on defense, but Watson can keep us in this game. Yeah. He can throw the ball all over the yard and throw touchdowns like it's, you know, free candy at a, at a carnival. You know, he, so you need the defense to go, hey, listen, we know you don't have it. We got your back. Yeah, and that's such a huge thing for an offensive, especially a young quarterback. Yes. They, if he knows his defense can pick him up when he's down, that's going to give him that much more confidence to take some strides and take mm-hmm. some shots. I mean, for Washington, obviously, trying to come back after Alex Smith went down is tough. Adrian Peterson, though, has found the fountain of youth. And, uh-huh. and 51 yards and two touchdowns. I mean, he's he's doing what he can to make sure Washington stays in that NFC East race. Say he's not having an MVP caliber year. He is having a very good year considering where the expectations were. Absolutely. No question about that. So for Washington, this is one that, I mean, obviously the NFC East is a kind of a weaker division this season. I don't think this loss is going to hurt them. And for Houston, a huge win. Yeah. Because if you look at the rest of the, their division, Houston is now 7-3. and three. Tennessee and Indy are both 5-5. Five and five. Yep. And Jacksonville? Mm-hmm. Well, is Jacksonville. Yep. But we're going to break that down next segment because we're going to talk a little more NFL with you. You are listening to the ODPH. Hey, this is Brian Wolf from Fair City Fire. You are listening to ODPH. The greatest podcast in Binghamton. Woo! Coming back on the ODPH this week, talking a little more NFL action. Now, Sound Guy Galore JR and Coach Duffy could not make it in this week, so we're going to talk a little more NFL breakdown with you. Pad, why don't you take us away with that? Well, I, I think we got to mention the sort of elephant in the room, if it were. Uh, one game that stood out to me, the absolute shellacking that the New Orleans Saints laid on the Philadelphia Eagles down in the Big Easy. Final score of 48-7. to Holy moly. Shellacking is one way to describe it. Drew yeah. Brees, 363 yards, four touchdowns. I mean, this was just a straight up. Yeah. That was a mauling. Yeah. This was like Khabib fighting anybody in the UFC. This was a mauling. Like yeah. you said, you can't put it any any different. I'll say I was driving around yesterday and I had this game on because I was interested in giving the matchup, you know, defending champs, New Orleans Saints, you know, you knew all the headlines going into it. And I had the, uh, because of the way Sirius works, and I mentioned this before, the way Sirius works, it was the home team feed, so it was the Saints feed. And they were coming out of halftime, and they are giving some stats and breaks down, and I believe Deuce McAllister was on the radio broadcast for them, which was oh. kind of which is kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. Long time Saints running back. Yep, and uh, they were talking, you know, the one negative thing they had coming out of the half was they punted. <laughs> like, you you performed in the first half so well that, like, the one negative on the on the first half is you had to punt. Yeah, that's that's a wild stat. But if you look at it, and I know we've talked about the Chiefs and we talk about the Rams being the best teams in the NFL. Man, don't sleep on New Orleans. Don't sleep on the Saints. Especially because I know everyone's kind of wondering where they can go from their receiving core. Des got hurt. They signed Brandon Marshall. What's Brandon Marshall going to bring? I know from listening to the Saints radio broadcast as I was driving around yesterday, their sideline reporter said that he was hanging out with Teddy Bridgewater on the sidelines, and Teddy had the, had the headset on, and when they he would hear the call, they were calling in to Breeze, and then Teddy would sit there and tell Brandon Marshall what they're doing, what they're lining up. What. So in-game, he is learning that playbook. And I think that that's also good for Bridgewater, too, because yeah. if you have the chance to sit behind a, a, a great quarterback. Hall of Fame worthy. Absolutely. Like Drew Brees. And especially for him still developing his game in the yeah. NFL. This is Sponge. Just, yeah, this is going to be something. I'm not saying he's going to be the next Aaron Rodgers. No. But this is can only help him. Yeah. And especially for Drew Brees – he's now, I mean, obviously this is his team and they're playing at such a high level. Yeah. 
like I said, we talk about the Chiefs, we talk about the Rams. We need to be talking about the Saints. Yeah, I mean, because you look at the running game, Mark Ingram, 16 carries, 103 yards. Alvin Kamara, 13 carries, 71 yards. Traquan Smith on the receiving end of it, 10 catches for 157 yards. Michael Thomas, four catches for 92 yards. It, it's just they were, it almost seemed like they were handing the ball off and running it well. I mean, this is one of those offenses that we know in New Orleans is good. Yeah. But these guys are great. Yeah. You, honestly, I don't know if there is a team right now in the league that can stop them, especially if they are home. Oh, yeah. If the Saints are away. If the Saints have to go on a road game and maybe to uh, L.A. or Green Bay, I'll even throw Green Bay in there, too. They might struggle a little bit just outside of the dome. But I think right now, I mean, you got to talk about the Saints as being the best team in the league. Oh, easily. And I mean, I'm looking at their schedule for the rest of the season. They've got the uh, Falcons in New Orleans. They travel to Dallas. Uh, then they travel to Tampa Bay. They travel to uh, Carolina. They're home against Pittsburgh, and then they close out the year home against Carolina. So they got some divisional games coming up. Yeah. So I mean, that's going to be a huge thing for them. But you got to look at them right now. If they can keep this momentum up and that defense, if they can keep doing what they're doing, well, I know we talk about Drew Brees all the time on the show. But if that defense can keep doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. They're going to be a scary team to face in the playoffs. Let's say they're scoring like 37 plus points a game, which is good for first in the league. And they're allowing tw- just shy of 24 points. Yeah, which you don't really think about with the Saints defense over the years. Not you, in a long time. No, not in a very long time. And then to flip the coin to the Eagles, I don't know if it's Ooh. the Super Bowl hangover. I don't know what is going on there. Carson Wentz is not playing well right now. No. 156 yards and three touchdowns or three interceptions. Rather. Yeah. That is not a stat line you want. I, man, I don't know what it is. It, it's possibly the Super Bowl hangover, but, I mean, it's, it's what, week 10, week 11? You really should be over it by now. You would think, but there's a lot of times when you win and you just you think you can turn it on at any time, you might be able to kick it in. I don't know with this Eagles team. I really don't. It's just kind of puzzling to see just how much they fell off. Maybe it's one of those scenarios like you see in baseball where, you know, you have a guy come up and he does really, really well to start out the year. And and the same can be said for Philly. I think Philly caught a lot of people off guard last year with how well they played. Mm -hmm. And now that all the teams have seen that and there's video on it, much like in baseball, a guy comes up, Aaron Judge. Yep. You know, a guy like Aaron Judge comes up, starts hitting home runs left, right, and center. Then you get video on the guy. Now you can go, okay, well, now we know what to do when they do this. Same thing for Philly, possibly, where team they caught teams off guard, but now that they've got the video, now they've got the, okay, we've had a solid offseason where we can sit back, dissect this, and play, game plan against us. Now Philly's at the point where, okay, they know what we do for what we've done. We need to adapt and adjust so that they don't see it coming, and they're not doing it. No, they're not, and that's probably the most puzzling thing is – they're a good team. They should be adapting to this. Yeah. And why they're not, I don't know. I mean, I know that the running game has had a lot of injuries. I'll give them that. Yeah. But this is just one of those puzzling things to see, especially that offense getting shut down to seven points against the Saints. Especially when they added Golden Tate right before the trade deadline. Yeah. And everyone was like, oh, my gosh, they're going to win it all again. Well, that was going to be the, the proverbial cherry on the Sunday. Yeah. That that's what Wentz and company need in that receiving core. Now, you got to really kind of step back and go, they might be able to sneak by and win the East. Maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe the NFC East. But after that, I don't see them going that far if they their, get in. Their chances have definitely improved to winning the East, given what happened with Washington on Sunday. I, I think had Alex Smith not gotten injured, there's no way, and you know what, Philly would have won anything and gotten in. Right. Their, I think their chances improved slightly, keyword slightly, with uh, the injury in Washington, but, man, you just don't know. You don't know, and obviously the NFC East is arguably one of the weaker divisions in the league. Yeah, I'd say so. If not the weakest. Just the season just kind of happens to be that way. So with that division being up for grabs, somebody can sneak in the playoffs that maybe not is, I don't want to say worthy of being there, but... It's not somebody you expect. It's not somebody you expect, and obviously it depends on if they can turn it around in the playoffs. I mean, it's just something to get to the playoffs yeah. is the big thing because yeah. we've seen teams sneak in as a wild card and ride all the way to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. It's one of the weird things in sports. But for Philly, they got a lot of questions. they got to start answering and answer quick. Yep. Because if they don't do that, season's done. Uh huh. So for my, dare I say, pick of the week, I am going to be breaking down Pittsburgh and Jacksonville. Uh huh. Now this was a rematch from the playoffs last year, and I will admit I was sitting with Bright Guy Signal from the Entertainment Edition, 
and a few other people watching the game, and this had to be one of the most ugliest games to watch. It wasn't pretty. Yeah. And by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, Pad was there with us too. I mean, Pad, you could how would you break down the first half? Ugly. Yeah. It it, it was not pretty. It was almost as if you gave two people a, a controller, Xbox, PlayStation, pick take your pick. Handed them to two people who don't know how to play football in any way shape or form and go, "Here, play football." Yeah, it was just one of those things as we're all sitting around watching. And I mentioned Bry guy because he's the big Steelers fan, and he was just dazed and confused of what was going on. And I will say, Jacksonville has a great defense. We've talked about this forever. Yeah. But they were looking like the 86 Bears that first half, and then I don't know what happened that fourth quarter. Let's just put it to this way. This might give you a better idea. You know, if you didn't see the game, this will give you a better idea of how bad this game was. Combined between the two teams – there were 15 punts. Yeah. Which, see, to me, because I don't routinely look at punting numbers, seems like an abnormally high number. Oh, that's crazy. I mean, it was just nobody could get an offensive going. No. Of offensive drive going anywhere. Like, I remember we were sitting there watching the game, and at one point they were showing CBS, because the game was uh, from CBS's broadcast, and they were showing, like, the five, last five or six Steelers offensive drives, mm-hmm. and it was like punt, 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 punt. And, and I'm, we were sitting there we're like, that's not a good stat. No, that's not something you want to be bragging about. I mean, even if you take a look at the line, I, it's not a true telling story because when you look at the second half of the game, especially the the third, the end of the third quarter going into the fourth, yeah, that's when you really kind of see when Ben Roethlisberger finally gets it going. But he looked awful that first half. I think oh, yeah. he, has, he has three interceptions in the first half. He had three interceptions in the first half and like a quarterback rating of zero. Yeah. And, but he wound up the day with 314 yards and two touchdowns. Yeah. Blake Bortles, 104 yards. Yeah. That And, I mean, Fournette is back in that offense for Jacksonville, but he's doing all he can. I mean, he had a great day with 95 yards on the ground and 46 receiving. Yeah. But the Steelers just couldn't get anything going until late in the game. Yeah. And when they finally did, when they finally hit Antonio Brown for that 78-yard touchdown. Oh, yeah. That was, like, the biggest momentum shift. And I don't think Jacksonville knew how to react. No. I, they looked... I don't want to say they looked shocked, but they looked shocked. They were shocked. They took their foot off the gas, and they just they just let up, and, and they gave Pittsburgh enough life to come back and really storm back and win the thing. Yeah, I mean, that's the wildest. Because, because for all intents and purposes, we were, like we said, we were watching this game. Jacksonville had this thing won. Yeah, they were up 16 nothing. Like the, It almost seemed like an MMA fight where you got two fighters fighting in the ring. One guy's dominating the you-know-what out of the other guy, and the ref's not calling it. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, Jacksonville let up, and the other guy fought back and beat him in the teeth. Yeah, I mean, it's just wild to see that Jacksonville let. For, I mean, first off, you let Antonio Brown get open yeah. for that much, and then he gets a seventy-yard touchdown. That just ignited the Steeler bench, and they all got wound up. And then Jacksonville just didn't have a counter punch for it. No. And then when Ben leading that fourth quarter charged down the field, and then him scoring the touchdown with five seconds left in the game to put him over the top, that like. That just shows Pittsburgh is ready for the playoffs now. Jacksonville, we got to wait and see. I'll say Pittsburgh leading the in Big Ben leading the charge down the field for that fourth quarter game winning drive when Pittsburgh, in my opinion, no offense to them, wasn't being the best clock managers of the world. They were no. they were burning a lot of clock. No, they're lucky they won this one. Yeah, I'll I'll be the first one to tell you they're lucky they won this one because they were getting in situations where if I'm playing mad and I'm sitting there mashing the you know the hurry up button and get to the line where they're just kind of sauntering down the field and kind of jogging. Yeah, well, I think that might be something that with Pittsburgh they've been in this position before. Then Ben does not get rattled, doesn't get too worried about stuff. I mean, obviously, he is a very good quarterback. He's won some Super Bowls. He knows what he's doing. And I think that that just kind of shows the veteran leadership where you still look at Jacksonville, and Jacksonville is still a very young team. Mm -hmm. They still need to find ways to win and close. Yeah. This was the game that they let a champion-caliber team like Pittsburgh stay stay in the fight. Yeah. And it came back to haunt them because now Jacksonville, 3-7. and Yep. Probably not making the playoffs unless no. they pull a heck of a run out. And I mean, there was some rumors that they were thinking about trading Jalen Ramsey in the off season, which is wild. Which is is crazy because he was your spark plug at the beginning of the season, and that whole GQ interview where he called out everybody, uh huh, everybody. Yep. And now you're three and seven. What are you really going to say about that? I mean, that whole swagger that they had at the beginning of the season is is gone. And, and it's one of those type of things that. As much smack as he was talking, 
it should be well thought something being brought up a lot in the interviews and i don't know if it is maybe it is but how do you answer that well, I mean, he's going to say he was talking, you know, for himself. But you, when you represent a team and you're and you're spouting off, this is what happens. And I'm not saying it's like a karmatic thing, if I can say karmatic, but this is something that when you call out and you you put that out in the world that you're going to take out everybody and every quarterback's yeah. garbage and everybody thinks, and then you wind up being three and seven. Yeah, you really shouldn't be making interviews like that. Uh, this is why we were saying before the season started, if they had, if this was after this season and they'd had another repeat very successful year. Okay. Yeah, then you got something. Yeah, Yeah, then you got room to talk. But this is like we said in our preview show for the season. Slow your roll, my guy. You know, let's wait and see. Don't count your eggs before they hatch. Don't put the cart before the horse. Insert whatever, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Saying you want to put there. Yeah, because if you're not, if your team isn't backing up what you're saying, that you're going to run away with this division, this is what comes back to haunt you. And yeah, granted, you won three quarters of a game, but you didn't win the fourth quarter. Pittsburgh did. And they won the game. And now Pittsburgh is getting hot at the right time. Oh, yeah. And dare I say, since the Le'Veon Bell drama is done for them, how much better did they look this game? I mean, obviously, just not so much the statistic-wise in the first half, but you kind of saw them more focused on the game. And it was every interview you heard was more about, okay, we got to beat Jacksonville. This is how we're going to do it. It's a tough game, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't so... Oh, we gotta worry about somebody tweeting from the sidelines about yeah. you know their drama. Pittsburgh, if they can get back to that Pittsburgh standard, they're gonna be scary in the playoffs. I tell you what, though, I'm looking at their schedule the remaining part of the year. It's not easy. Uh next week they've got the next game they've got is uh in Denver against the Broncos. They give out a home game against the Chargers, they travel to the Raiders. Then they're home against the Patriots, they travel to New Orleans, and then they close out the year at home against Cincinnati. It's definitely not going to be easy, but I still think that they're going to sneak out the central. Oh yeah, they will. Yeah, it's yeah. just they're they're playing at too high level. Barring any major injury, I think they sneak in there. Yeah, and they're going to be another team that you got to watch because no matter what the record is, Pittsburgh is going to show up for the playoffs. Oh yeah, they've they've got the veteran experience and the and the wherewithal to perform in the playoffs. Yeah, so now I mean every game is just magnified that much more. You know, after Thanksgiving, this is when the microscope really comes out uh-huh. and you really see who's a contender and who's a pretender. Yep. But let us know what you think. Hashtag it up with us, ODPH. We want to know what's your thoughts on this past week of the NFL action. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm Mike Pappy from Rye Bread, and you're listening to the ODP. Coming back for another segment on this week's ODPH, and we got to talk a little Major League Baseball awards. Uh huh. Now, Pad, you were not here last week, so nope. but this is all your subject. You are the baseball guru of the group. Break it down to us. What are your thoughts of the Major League Baseball postseason awards? Well, the one change I would like to make to the MLB postseason awards: announce them all at once, please. Yeah, that's it's you. NHL does it, NBA does it, NFL does it. Now they all have award shows and the whole nine. That's fine. They could do that. Whatever. Announce them all at once. I've been thinking this for the better part of maybe a decade where I hate how you get to the end because the for those who don't know, the awards are voted on before the end of the regular season. So these are determined back in like September. Mm-hmm. And they don't wait they wait to announce them until after the season is done and they spread it out over a week. Just do it all at once, please. Uh but regardless. Uh looking not gonna go through every award, kinda go through the big four, that being the manager of the year, rookie of the year, Cy Young, and MVP awards. Uh starting with the manager of the year awards, uh for the American League, it was Bob Melvin of the Oakland Athletics, and for the National League, it was Brian Snitaker of the uh Atlanta Braves. Can't argue either. I mean no. b- both of those guys did a tremendous job this season with their teams. And especially with Atlanta, I mean, they were not predicted to do no. anywhere near where they did. No, and, and you look at the Oakland A's where everyone they kind of pulled a, a money ball type scenario where nobody really penciled them in to do anything and they went on a heck of a run. Well that's the thing about Oakland is that, I mean they are known for playing the money ball. Yeah. That that and it's the wow where they just it seems like for anybody that's not familiar with that term, that is just where the team is pretty much not based on big superstar names, but no. statistics. And if there's a great film out called Moneyball that breaks down their kind of like whole schematics of, of you know their rosters, which is just wild to think about. Yeah. 
that it works. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to work every time. No. But in situations, especially Oakland, they do find ways to do this. So even if they have an off year the year prior, they usually swing back the next year and they're mm-hmm. right in the mix of things. So, I mean, kudos to those guys because, I mean, they did a tremendous job with their teams. Yeah. Uh, switching over to the Rookie of the Year awards. Uh, oh, here we go. I know you're waiting to talk about this one. That's why I'm starting with the easy one first. Uh, nationally, you had Braves outfielder Ronald Acuna Jr. won. Uh, he finished with a team-leading 26 home runs, 16 steals, and slugged an impressive 552. Yeah, he he's definitely going to be a franchise player for those oh, guys for yeah. years to come. Oh, yeah. And then in the American League, uh, yeah. I'm going to let you go off on this one. I know you've been stewing about this. The The award was given to the Angels' Shohei Otani, which I have I take issue with this because, okay, yes, he's the first player in Lord knows how long to pitch and hit in the same season. Impressive, yes, I, I grant you. But for me, being the baseball guy and really watching and paying attention to stuff, the hype and, and whatnot after the, like, the first month of the season really died down. And I kind of took exception with either one. I, I really thought either one of the Yankees rookies could have won it. I Take your pick. Give me a coin. I'll take either one of them. Mm-hmm. You know, but I just take issue with, okay, Otani really only pitched for like half the year because he had he had the arm injury, couldn't pitch, then he hit. But he never really like did anything stellar to me. What's your thoughts on it? You know, I, I could go either way. I see the argument for both sides. Otani had great stats beginning of the year. And, yeah, he, he – I mean, the comparisons are what, to Babe Ruth? Yeah. So, obviously, when you're in that discussion, it warrants, you know, consideration for rookie of the year. I get it. So, I'm not as angry about it as you are. And I mean, but but I but I understand the point to it because, yeah, he was great at the beginning of the year, but obviously we start getting injured as the season progressed. I mean, for me, I would give it to Gleyber Torres. Yeah, that's me, but I don't struggle with it as much with Otani, because, like I said, he came out the gate raring, and he was definitely getting all the headlines, and rightfully so. His performance on the field was tremendous to watch. Yeah, but it seemed like he was breaking down, and I mean, you just kind of wait. Okay, if you're factoring in the time that he was healthy and crushing it to win, you know, the overall picture, then yeah, I guess I can see where you you give him the Rookie of the Year, which, mm-hmm. like I said. I don't struggle with it as much as I know you do, yeah. and I, I fully get it. I'm not, oh, I'm yeah, not saying yeah. you're right or wrong, yeah. but it's just for me, I don't struggle with it as much. And like I said, Torres would have been my guy for it. Yeah. Switch in order to the Cy Young Awards uh, for the American League. Cy Young, you had uh, the Rays starting pitcher Blake Snell uh, when he had an uh, he led the American League with 21 wins and a 1.89 ERA. And uh, becoming the second Rays pitcher to win the award uh, since uh, second since David Price won it for them in 2012. Uh, so congratulations to him. I forget the exact stats, but you know something just clicked for him this year where he had an okay year last year, nothing really phenomenal, but then just something this year just just clicked. And sometimes that happens. I mean, that's the one weird thing about baseball, and you see how players, great players, stay consistent throughout their careers. Yeah, good players go through streaks. Where they have great seasons and they kind of taper off a little bit and then they find ways to come back. This is a prime example of, okay, you had a good season last year and you made the adjustments Mm -hmm. to elevate your game to that next level. So that makes perfect sense to me. I don't struggle with that one at all. No, and then switching over to the National League. This is the one we talked about earlier in the year that if he didn't win this award, there was going to be riots. Yeah, this would be a travesty if if he didn't get the nomination. Jacob deGrom won the National League Cy Young Award, of course, uh, won 10 games, but had the uh, the fewest ever by a starter, but his ERA of 1.70 was the lowest in baseball among qualified starters and the sixth lowest since MLB lowered the mound to its current height in 1969. All I'm going to say, and I know Mets fans, hit us up on that hashtag ODPH. If DeGrom was on a better hitting team, mm-hmm. he would have won 20 games. I would say so. Without question. Yes. You, Factor in, let's say we throw him on the Red Sox, oh, oh. or we throw him on the Yankees. Oh, oh Lord have mercy! Let, let's just put that out there: a team that is putting up runs every game. Let's say they were one, two in the American League, right? So let's just throw that out there. I'm not even saying the NL, but yeah. I'm just saying the yeah. AL, yeah. which had the best hitting. You know, in my opinion, you put him on there, he wins 20 games, maybe even 25. I Red Sox, he wins 25 plus. Yeah, he, he might set the record. I'm just saying, like with the Mets, and I get it. 
And I get it that they they struggled hitting the ball this season. There's no question yeah. about that. That's yeah. that's not a rip on the Mets because no. I can already hear Sanger Galore tweeting right now. This is just a situation where Degrom pitched his tail off, mm-hmm. and rightfully so. And if there was any MVP for a team that was a non hitter, oh yeah, he's it's at the, it's Degrom. He's at because without him, you take him out of that lineup. How badly are they getting blown out every night oh. with, when he's supposed to be starting? If you, if you, Wait, just take you, those might, you might start talking football scores. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy to see how much talent he has on there, and they just can't find ways to get him runs. I'm not saying this is like a Sonny Gray situation. Right. Because I know we talk Yankees on here a lot. Because, you know, with Sonny, it's just you, he was always the guy that last season was never getting run support. Yeah. This is a situation where it's like this is your ace. Yeah. And you can't get him runs, right? And if you, just imagine if you did, he would. Like I said, he he might have set the record for wins in the season. Oh, easily, he, he might easily. Have. And now, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen this off season. You hear a lot of crazy, crazy talk mm-hmm. about trades. If if the Mets can't get him hitting, you know, I don't I don't know what you do if if you're him. I mean, obviously, what else can you do to help your team win? I mean, I think they hold on to him at least until the trade deadline, and then if things are there, if things are going a repeat performance of this year, mm-hmm. he he'll be dealt at the trade deadline. Yeah, because I think if he has another stellar performance like this, the Mets could get a king's ransom. Oh, he's he, they'll get a king's ransom for him now, right? But you imagine if they held on to him if he's doing the same numbers next year. Uh huh. He, you want to rebuild your team in a hurry? Well, that'll do it. Done. That'll do it. <laughs> done. Done. Deal. Mm hmm. Switching to the MVP awards uh, in the National League, Kristen, Christian Yelich of the uh, Milwaukee Brewers won this. He ran away with this thing, in my opinion. 770 slugging percentage after the All Star break. It was the best in the uh, baseball's best in 14 years. And and then on the American League side, uh, Mookie Betts of the Boston Red Sox won it for them. So congratulations to the both of them. For me, it, it was Christian Yelich and nobody else. Oh, yeah. for In the NL, there, yeah, it was Yelich and that was it. He, I mean, you just saw his numbers. And like I said, what, his slugging percentage after the All-Star break. 770. <sighs> I mean, who else is doing that? I mean. Uh, maybe Babe Ruth in his prime. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing you got to look at. I mean, you, you take a look at the body work, and he was and he was doing well before the All Star break, yeah. and then you talk about players who who t- ramp it up after the break. Yeah, Yelich set the example. I mean, he's the one who willed his team to the NL you know championship series. Yep. If you break that down, it's just he did all he could, and he made his team better around him. Oh yeah, that's what you want with your MVP. When you take a look at Boston, it's not a slight to Mookie Betts by any means, but no. that team was already stacked. But he did enough to help his team win, and yeah. obviously. They had one of the best seasons in baseball history. I hate saying that as a Yankee fan, mm-hmm. but I will give the Devils their due. With Betts in that lineup, I mean, it was a wholly different, a totally different dynamic in that lineup. And that's that's what pushed them over the edge, Yep, I think. The other bit of baseball news, of course, the uh, Hall of Fame voting ballot, if I guess you could call it, came out today. And, that, of course, it came with uh, some notable first-timers on this list. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jason Bay. Former Met uh, on there for the first time. Lance Berkman, former Houston Astros, on there for the first time. Travis Hafner uh, on there for the first time. Doc Holliday on the f- there for the first time. Todd Helton, uh, Derek Lowe, uh, Roy Oswalt, Andy Pettit, Juan Pierre, Mariano Rivera, uh, Miguel Tejada, just to name a few. Uh, I think if there's any guarantees, it is Roy Holiday, Andy Pettit, Mariano Rivera. I will say Holiday, and I will say Rivera. Had it, I, in my opinion, should, but I could see it maybe not going that way. I, I can see him getting it because if I'm not mistaken, I think it's like they need 75% of the vote to get in. I can see Petty getting like somewhere in the 60s. Yeah, he might not get in the first go around, but he, he will definitely get in he'll, there, he'll at, get in at, there. At, at some point. I, I, at least I feel so. Let's say because if memory still serves, he has or had the uh, Major League Baseball postseason wins record for a pitcher. Yeah, is is just one. He of those, might still have it. He might not. I can't remember. It, but it's one of those situations that you you don't know how the voting is going to do. It's like when you're hearing this list is like who's automatics. Mm-hmm. Mariano Rivera is an automatic. He will probably get ninety nine percent of the vote because there's always somebody. Yeah, there's going to be that one guy always. And I don't understand that. That to me that just makes no sense. No, like why to get you, you the greatest closer of all time. Yeah. Why are we even having a discussion about Greatest this? closer of all time that, like, nev, to my knowledge, never made a stink or a fuss about anything. You never heard bad on the guy. 
No, he was. I mean, he was a class act. And you take a look at the Yankee, you know, Big Four in the nineties. Yeah, and to going into two thousand, and Mariano definitely was consistent. And for one pitch too, mm-hmm. he only threw a cutter. You couldn't no, hit cutter in a fastball. Well, yeah. yeah, it was pretty much the same thing. You, but you couldn't stop it. The only person who did was David Ortiz. Yeah, and of course he got hit at the worst possible times. Yeah, that happened. But like I say. Mariano, that's that's a no brainer. That should be a unanimous one. Yep. I fear it's not going to be. And Roy Holiday, you, he'll get a posthumous vote in as he should. I, yeah, him. I because I know a couple of years ago I had a, just some a discussion with some friends about potential future Hall of Famers. Doc Holiday was always one for me that like he would get in. I wasn't sure where, but he would get in. I think given he just died recently and everything surrounding that, he'll get in first ballot. Oh, he should. I mean, his stats and just. He was just one of those pitchers that was just dominating no matter where he went. Mm-hmm. And just to see, like, just his stats alone, that's yeah. enough to get him in. So I think that's your probably two safest bets of, yeah. you know, first ballot. Like I said, Pettit, I think, should get in. I don't think he gets in the first time, though. No. And then, of course, the one everyone will be looking at, of course, is Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. Seventh year on the ballot, uh, Bonds had 56.4%. Uh, vote and Roger Clemens had fifty seven point three percent of the vote. Will it go up? Will it stay the same? Yeah, we'll see. It's tough. It, yeah, it really is because whatever side of the fence you're on about the steroids yep. topic, this is where things get very messy. Mm-hmm. And for the Hall of Fame, it's always if you're connected to that in any way, shape, or form, it's almost like a death sentence. Yeah, that they will not connect anybody to it we'll say but i will know their vote percentages of votes have gone up over the years because if memory serves their first year they got like mid to low 20s it's it, it's like that because i mean as as time is going on and it's just you know however the the perception is about it yeah i think it's changed in some voters minds is it enough to get over the 75 percent I'm going to say no. I'm going to go out on a limb and say uh, no. Yeah, I don't I'm think not, so. I'm not speaking bad about them because obviously their stats speak for themselves. But if they're getting held back because of the whole steroid controversy, mm-hmm. then you know what is going to change that much to sway that many voters to get them in? Yeah. That's the tough part. And anybody connected to them, that's going to factor in on them as well. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a very slippery slope to to try figuring out do i think they get in no i don't think they do no but then you you have to argue then you know it's like where do you go with this right because you're setting a precedent and you have to follow that precedent going forward to the letter you you can't have any gray area with it no so then you gotta stick to your guns about this and then what you know that's where the bar is set Depending on what your opinion is of it. So hit us up on the hashtag ODPH and let us know what you think of that. But overall, in closing, though, there's a lot of names on that first ballot this year. Like I said, Mariano is my lock to get in. Oh, yeah. Um, My leap will be Miguel Tejada. (laughs) I'll I'll word it like that. I got a a feeling he might sneak in there. It might happen eventually. Yeah, it might happen. So I'll give you my lock and leap on that. But... Either way, I mean, good luck to everybody that's in voting for it, and we'll see what happens next year at Cooperstown. Mm -hmm. Let us know what you think. Hit us up on that hashtag, ODPH. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Vince, the Cowan Man a local MMA fighter, telling you to keep on listening to the ODPH, the 607's up-and-coming newest podcast. Coming back for the ODPH Local Minute Pad. Take us away. Of course, talking a little Binghamton Devils news. Looking back at the week that was, uh, they had a couple games last week. Uh, they had two against the Marlies and then one against the uh, Crunch where they uh, went one and two, unfortunately. Switching to this week, uh, they've got a game this coming Wednesday, November 21st, 
at home against the Syracuse Crunch, game time 7.05, and then they travel uh, Friday up to Syracuse to play the uh, aforementioned Crunch. Saturday, they return back home to play the Americans, game time 7.05, uh, of course, more details, BinghamtonDevils.com. Looking at the standings, still sitting in third place with a uh, record of 8-7. and seven. Uh, Just a couple games back behind the Rochester Americans, who are 11-4. and four. I will say this, though. The Binghamton Devils are playing very hard hockey. I Yeah, I will agree. They're definitely skating from period to period. I will agree, because I went to the game uh, back on my birthday, November 9th, and wasn't a pretty game. Uh, some questionable calls from the ref, especially uh, when I say boarding penalty, what comes to mind? Guy hit below the plexiglass onto the actual boards. Mm. Refs called a boarding penalty on us for a guy that got hit into the plexiglass. Questionable calls. Uh, but I will say this. They gritted out that win because there was at least a solid minute 45 left in the third period where the opposing team pulled their goalie. So they played six on five hockey for like a solid minute and a half plus didn't give up a goal and that, won the game. I mean, it just shows you. I mean, there's this whole new mentality for the Binghamton Devils. They're very fun to watch. And like I said, splitting this past weekend with Toronto was not, you know, it's, it's a good learning experience for them because they're still such a young team. Mm-hmm. And they're definitely skating in every game. I mean, they're, yeah. they're not blowing anybody away, mind you. I mean, they did have that blowout against Utica. But, I mean, they're, they're playing solid hockey. They're very fun to watch. And like Pat mm-hmm. said, BinghamtonDevils.com. And we got to talk about those Binghamton Bulldogs. Yep. Now, the Bulldogs are now 7th ranked in the nation. Okay. And they are definitely picking up where they left off last year. Good for them. They were winners this weekend. They were home against Pottstown and won 133-97. to Chris Cartwright Holy pulled, cow. He pulled the triple-double, 2012 and 11. And then they went on the road to Oneana. Okay. Now, Oneana is a very good team, I will say, because I've seen them play this season. Okay. But... I don't know what got into the Bulldogs. I didn't see the game, obviously. I was I didn't make the trip to Oneana. Do you want to take a guess on how many points they dropped in the second half? Oh, uh, 85. Close. Ooh. Very good call. 86. Ooh. And I tell you, they got running again. Chris Cartwright had another huge game, 40 points. Ooh. And the one thing about the Dogs is between Cartwright, David Hay, Moni Anderson, and they don't even have Jimmy Gray back in the lineup yet. Right. They have a very solid guard system of players that can shoot the lights out any night they need to. I'm going to say Cartwright almost seems like he's playing like he's standing on a on a pier and the basket's the ocean and he cannot miss. He is the heart and soul of the team, like without question. Like in my opinion, yeah, he is definitely the guy that they go to for you know when they need an emotional leader on the court. He finds ways to win. He's great to watch. And everybody that's on the court with him feeds off him. And like I said, David Hay is having a great season thus far. Moni Anderson is lights out from the three-point line. Oh, yeah. You can almost guarantee every time he throws it up, it's going in. I can go on and on about it, but honestly, if you have not been to a Binghamton Bulldogs game, and we still have not figured out what to call Dog Pound 2.0. We'll, can, come, we'll come up with we're something. We're going to come up with something. Jimmy Evans has to come back on the show, and we're I'm officially calling him out to come back on the ODPH. To settle this debate, because Coach Duffy, Pat, and myself have been going back and forth about what we should be calling it, DP2. Uh, either way, if you have not been to a Binghamton Bulldogs game this season, mm-hmm. what are you waiting for? Because, obviously, the Dogs are putting in some work. Like I said, they beat Oneana 149-123, to uh, 123, and they're going to be back at home December 1st for Scranton. Scranton beat them. This is the only loss they've had this season. It's going to be rocking at the dog pound 2.0 or whatever we want to call it. Either way, December 1st, if you got the chance to make it to the game, make it to the game. BinghamtonBulldogs.com for more information. Support those dogs. Support your Mm -hmm. local sports because that is the basis of all sports that we watch. Yep. So we're going to go to the RTB segment, and we have some breaking news as we are recording. And this is one of the weird times that we actually have something in our favor. Yeah. Because usually we have a breaking story after we've recorded and then we got to go hit the blogs, which I hope you're reading Daily Dice on the ODPH website. But Pad, why don't you take us away with the big news? Well, this came down shockingly. The Yankees have acquired left-handed pitcher James Paxton from Seattle in exchange for left-handed pitcher Justice Sheffield, right-handed pitcher Eric Swanson, and outfielder Dom Thompson-Williams. Of course, Justice Sheffield, their top-rated prospect, made a brief appearance, I believe, at the end of uh, this past year 
But little surprising, to say the least, that they've dealt him away for uh, James Paxton. This is wild. And I guess Mike C. from Horror Zone 607 is chiming in right now. We're going to try getting a blog from him on the Daily Dice section about this. Mm -hmm. But in his words, Brian Cashman strikes again. He should be fired on the spot. Um, I'm going to keep my language clean, but I just want to let everybody know I am furious about this trade. This is Mike C. from Horror Zone 607. I will post his Twitter for Horror Zone 607 on the ODPH website. Hit him up and let him know what you think of this trade. I'm shocked by this. I am too, given how how many offers they supposedly had gotten for Justice Sheffield and how many they turned down. I'm I'm not upset by it. I'm kind of sitting here going, okay. I'll, I'll I'll obviously the upgrading the rotation has been a priority from the outset with the Yankees offseason. Forget Harper and Machado. For them, priority number one is fixing that rotation because that was arguably one of their weaker points of the entire season. Adding Paxson might upgrade it. I mean, I look at his record from last year. He was eleven and six with an ERA of three point seven six. But it's in Seattle. Seattle really didn't have anything going on the entire year. So, and and the Yankees know more about Justice Sheffield than I ever will. You know, they've got the video, they've got the scouts, they've got the the you know employment to go check out and know what the heck is going on. Maybe there was once they, because the thing I'm I'm thinking as I'm sitting here, they didn't they had all those offers for him before they called him up and before they brought him up. It's one thing to see a guy pitch in Double A, Triple A, Single A. It's a whole other thing to throw him into the big leagues and see how he does. Only thing I can think is they brought him up for that brief stretch at the end of last year. He wasn't there for the playoffs, but right at the end of the year. Maybe they saw something they didn't like. Maybe it continued, and they saw some stuff in the offseason. Didn't like how it was going. You know what? Maybe we're better off getting something for him. It's just crazy to think, especially with all their pitching issues, uh-huh. that they're willing to deal their top pitching prospect. Yeah. this There's got to be something to this. I don't know. See, the thing of it is, though, is they've done this in the past, though. And I, mean, I have The one that comes to mind is Austin Jackson. Austin Jackson, at one point, was their highest-rated outfield prospect before Aaron Judge. Mm-hmm. And they were high on him, and they traded him to, I believe it was Detroit, and yeah. I, the exact year escapes me. But I'm sitting there going, why are you trading your top-rated outfield prospect, and what has Austin Jackson done since then? Well, it's the one thing about prospects you don't know. I mean, they could be the next Derek Jeters. They could be yeah. the next Flash in the Pans. You, you don't know. Yeah. But, but for the Yankees and what they need, this is just crazy to me. And we'll see what Paxton does. I mean, because obviously the history books are going to be the ones that tell us we're right or wrong. Yeah. I am shocked by this. Mike C is going completely bananas about this. Uh, you can hit him at at Horror Zone six oh seven to definitely let him know what you think of this trade. But overall, I mean, this is just wild to see because I figured the first pitcher they would trade is Sonny Gray. Well, he is on the trading block, and I have heard a couple. I think Cincinnati was one place I heard he was rumored to possibly going for who I don't know. That's one I did read. But I, I mean, the thing with Paxton that works in the Yankees' favor is uh, this past year he was twenty nine years old, so he is still young. He still does have his prime pitching ahead of him. I'm a wait and see kind of guy. We'll see. Yeah, it's gonna be something to see. And definitely. I didn't, I didn't think J. A. Happ would work for the Yankees, and he actually ended up working out pretty good. Yeah, so we'll we'll see if Cashman can prove us wrong. Definitely hit us up on that hashtag ODPH and let us know what you think. Mm-hmm. And for your RTB segment, well, this one came down as a little bit of a surprise. It's uh, from the NBA. This came down uh, this afternoon as we record from the Woj. Mm-hmm. Uh, from ESPN. Uh, basically, anyone, if you are a currently employed and playing basketball for the Washington Wizards, you are on the trading block, and they are not afraid to trade you, including Bradley Beal and John Wall. This is wild. I yeah. How we're not even what a month into the season almost barely. And how many trades and how much talking of moving players is going around? We talked about this on last week's show with Jimmy Walker coming, or not Jimmy Walker, Jimmy Butler coming to Philly. Philly. We talked about Melo getting released. Yeah. We have no idea what the drama is going on in Golden State because I don't think that's done. I think everybody's no. trying to play nice for the cameras. But yeah. I think I still think Kevin Durant is coming east and he's going to look amazing in that Knicks uniform next season. Uh huh. But now Washington's taking offers, and they're dumping the arguably the best backcourt in basketball. Arguably. Yeah, you can yeah. argue, because obviously Curry and Thompson have something to say yeah, about that. Yeah. But if you're talking, I'll say in the East, who's better than Beal and, and Wall? It's hard to argue at this point. It's, it's, it's a difficult argument. You can make one, yeah. but it's difficult. But if they're willing to dump, okay, are they trying to clear cap room to maybe try again Durant? Boy, I, are, I don't I mean, know. I mean, just, just to... 
to forfeit your season like this and, and send that message out. I'll say because they're they've played sixteen games. Mm-hmm. This this isn't like oh hey we're after the All Star break. It's not going well. We have no chance in in God's green earth to make the playoffs even as an eight seed. Tank. Let's just go for what we can get. That I would understand to a degree. But you're sitting here. It's it's mid November. And you played 16 games. You're not even in last place. You're not even the worst team in the Eastern Conference. Yeah. And you're like, oh, hey, anybody on the team, including Bradley Beal and John Wall, yeah, well, we're willing to trade them. Insane. This is just insane to me. And and honestly, I hope Wall goes to the Knicks. That'd be good. I'm going to throw the karma out there. Let's see if the ODPH karma can work here. If we can somehow get John Wall for next to nothing, because if they're willing to, to move him. This is just, it's wild. Like, I mean, I can't see... How they're willing to dump that backcourt and implode that team this mm-hmm. early in the season? Like I can understand after Christmas Day, maybe because Christmas Day is kind of where you really know where you stand. But this is nuts, and to factor all this in with what's going on with Philly and Jimmy uh-huh. Butler, and you know what's happening there, and Golden State's drama, and then Houston. Houston needs help in the worst way. I, I don't think either one of Beal or Wall would help them if no. they're they going to make a move. I don't even know where they go unless you try making a deal with the Lakers to get LeBron help. Yeah, because maybe. Because he could use some, but, I mean, where do you send those guys that, that would make the most sense? Mm-hmm. I think the Knicks would make a lot of sense because I think the Knicks are going to be ready to rebuild. I mean, it just depends on what they move for draft picks because I know they're eyeing everybody from Duke this season. Oh, yeah. So I don't think anybody's willing to part with a number one pick. No, no. There, If you are a bottom-of-the-league team, you are not parting with your number one draft, your first-round draft pick this year. I don't, man, I don't even know where they wind up. I, I, This is just crazy for me to think, especially at 16 games in the season. Mm-hmm. Just everybody's willing to pack up ship and, and – Go that route. It's just mind-blowing to me. Other thing to keep an eye on this week for the NBA, uh, Wednesday, November 21st, uh, 8 o'clock, ESPN, Los Angeles Lakers at the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, I, I expect LeBron to get a hero's welcome. Yes. I do. I don't think it's going to be as bad as when he went to Miami and came back there. No. And no. I think the Lakers win that one by 18. I'd say so, yeah. Um, I We'll see what happens. I mean, the Cavs have just got a lot of issues. Yeah, to put it mildly, and I, and I root for the Cavs, you know, as my secondary team. Yeah, but I just I think LeBron and company is going to have a stellar game. I think it's going to be an emotional night, and I mean, if you're a Cleveland fan, you just have to say thank you to LeBron. Yeah. He, like I said in past episodes, he didn't need to come back. No, and I will admit, I was one of the biggest critics for him leaving for Miami. I I do not deny that fact at all, but the fact he decided to come back and he won you a chip. Uh huh. He won you a championship. For like the first time in like 50 years. Yeah, enough said. There, There is no argument. He won you a championship. Done. Yeah. Say thank you, and then you can watch him completely. He'll, he'll get a standing ovation, you know, hero's welcome, like five-minute standing ovation when he gets introduced in player introductions. Yeah, there shouldn't be anybody. It, it's going to be it's gonna be the one instance in on the nationally televised broadcast, because I know to nationally, uh, outside of like the All-Star game and like playoff games, they really don't do player introductions for... Oh, they'll do one for this. They'll do it for this. Yeah, and he should get a standing ovation. No question. Should be a no-brainer. Should be fun to watch. Uh-huh. So let's go into those locks and leaps, shall we? Pad, you want to kick us off? Well, yeah, looking at the locks and leaps, there was one that stood out to me for my lock. Had to jump on it. Couldn't resist it. San Diego Chargers at home against the uh, Arizona Cardinals. Chargers currently a 12-point favorite against those Arizona Cardinals. Still love it that you call them San Diego. Nah, Still love it. Still love it. Never going to get over it. Take it. Lock it up. Chargers are going to win that one big. Switching over to my leap. One stuck out to me as an interesting one. Sunday night on the NF- NBC game, uh, the Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. Minnesota is currently a three-and-a-half-point favorite. I just think it's something about it. It's Aaron Rodgers, primetime, Sunday night. He always does something wild and crazy on Sunday night mm-hmm. that you're talking about for a couple days afterwards. I think that this is going to be another instance. I think the Packers are going to pull this one out. You know what? I, You don't know what you're going to get on Minnesota. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously at this stage... They're very streaky. I know Sangha Galore JR is going to be lighting up our social media about this. But I'm going to get an angry text message. Oh, yeah, we all are for this one. But you don't know what you're going to get on Minnesota. You know it's Aaron Rodgers Sunday night. Yeah. He tends to shine on Sunday night. Mm-hmm. More so than Sunday afternoon. When the, when the lights are brightest, he shines bright. That's when he shows up. So it, that'll be something fun to watch. Yep. 
You know, I was going to take the Chargers, but they burned me last week, so ah. I'm going to steer away from them for my locks and leaps. Okay. I, I have to on principle. So if I'm going into this, I am going to take Carolina favored three and a half over Seattle. Ooh, okay. They're home. Carolina's going to do it. I was eyeing all the Thursday games, too, and we want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving in yeah. our listening audience, too, because Thursday's going to have a stacked card. Bears and Lions, Redskins, Cowboys, and Falcons, Saints, and the night game. It's all good games. It's all good games, and they all look very tempting. Uh-huh. But I'm going to go with Cam Newton and the boys. They're home. Seattle's got to travel. It's it's ob- it's going to be almost like a playoff eliminator for this. Seattle's 5-5, five and five, Carolina's 6-4. and four. So, obviously, this is a must-win for them, and I do like them. And for my leap, okay, I just need to see the point spread. I'm circling them wagons. Oh. I am not scared okay. of Jacksonville. Okay. I am not scared of Ramsey. I'm not scared of Doug Marone, the head coach. They're coming to Orchard Park. Yep. I don't know who the quarterback is. It's probably going to be real cold. It's going to be real cold. It's going to be Josh Allen with one good arm. Yep. Or it's going to be Matt Barkley who will find the fountain of youth again like he was playing at USC. It won't be Nathan Peterman. Nope. Even though I heard he got a tryout in Detroit or uh, Washington. I, I heard they were looking at him. Somebody was looking at him, by all means. Just keep him out of Buffalo. Either way, we are going to circle them wagons. We are going to find a way to win. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be like a 6-3 game. because There, that's there what could the, be a blizzard. That was what that playoff game was last year, and it's going to be like the same thing all over again but the Bills are going to come out on top. Mark the tape. Lock it in. I know it's a leap, but, hey, I got to roll with it because nobody circles the wagons like the Bills Mafia. This is true. And, you know, I'm sticking to my guns about that. That's all we got for this week. So for Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Kenham. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH. We'll see you next time.